Welcome to day two of the nitrogen cycle. Today, our learning target is I can deduce the consequences of industrialized nitrogen fixation by making connections to previous topics. Let's look at what those previous topics are. All right, so the first topic we covered in this class was earth systems. Then we went on to human population and urbanization. And then finally, we ended the semester with feeding the world. All right, so how might the nitrogen cycle connect to these other units? All right, well, we've impacted the nitrogen cycle in numerous ways. One of the ways that we're gonna be learning more about in a coming unit is the combustion of fossil fuels. And we're, we're gonna be looking at how burning those fossil fuels sends some different nitrogen compounds into the atmosphere. Um, but we've already seen some of this when we did our field trip, right? One of the things that we tested for were nitrogen compounds in the Hudson River. So here's the Hudson River, and we were on one of these piers over here. And one of the things that we discussed was the fact that our, our system for sewage is outdated, and when it rains, we get these combined sewage overflows, and that can really be a problem for our river. Another problem that we learned about was uh, these feedlots that produce a lot of waste and it's really concentrated. And here we're looking at a satellite image of one of those feedlots. Here are the feedlots, right, with the cattle, right? And we can see that there's some runoff from those feedlots and that's going into a nearby waterway and it looks pretty gross, um, that can't be good. That's a pretty dramatic example. This is another example of the human impact on the nitrogen cycle. Not as dramatic as what we were just looking at with the livestock, but again, here we see a farmer who has some liquid fertilizer and he's applying that to this giant field. And the problem is, is the plants just can't take up all of that nitrogen and phosphorus, right? And it just ends up running off. And when that happens, right, we end up with this situation. It leads to an over-fertilized world. And, you know, that's really what we're seeing in a very dramatic way, just like we saw with the feedlots, right? This is an enormous algal bloom, and you can see just it's just this waterway is just choked with it. That's a speedboat, right? And it's just, you know, going through all this algae. Okay, so this is a huge problem. So all of that excess nitrogen that we're applying to the land that's running off into water, that leads to cultural eutrophication. And we've seen this word before. We've been tested on it. It was on the final. Right, so this is showing normal versus eutrophied, all right? Normal lake, a lake during eutrophication, all right? And let's look at a better diagram that gives more detail to, as to what's going on there. Okay, so we have some excessive nutrient inputs. That's the fertilizer that goes into the waterway and it causes an algal bloom, okay? And that's really, you're causing a trophic cascade and those algae die off, right? They decompose. That process, as you learn by doing your homework, that requires oxygen, okay? So it's just pulling all the oxygen out of the water. All right, in contrast, right, this system here is healthy and we can see that there's adequate oxygen, we have more biodiversity, right? So, you know, minimal nutrient inputs, that's actually what a system needs because, you know, these systems have evolved with those limiting factors and that's, that's a more balanced system. 
right? You had a homework assignment where you were introduced to the Haber-Bosch process. So we're going to be looking at that in a little bit more detail here. And I want to point this out. This is actually the chemical reaction that's happening in the Haber-Bosch process. So we take atmospheric nitrogen. We need some gaseous hydrogen. And where are we getting this from? Well, we need to split the water molecule in order to free up that hydrogen. And hydrogen and oxygen actually really like to be bonded together, so it requires a lot of energy to split a water molecule. Now here's the thing. You have seen this chemical reaction before. You saw this in chemistry. It is the reaction that the reagents loves to use to show you a system at equilibrium. All right, and we know that this is at equilibrium. We have the double arrow. So when this system reaches equilibrium, you have the forward and the reverse reaction going at the same rate. That's a problem because what we're really trying to do here is create more ammonia. All right, so there's a lot of ways that scientists can perturb this system to make more product. And if you remember, we used this analogy of being on a teeter-totter, right? We have this side on the teeter-totter, this side at equilibrium, they're balanced, right? But if you add a stress, so let's say we add something to this side, well, we'll get more product, right? So one thing we can do is we can add pressure because on this side of the equation, we have four moles of gas, and on this side, we only have two moles. So adding more pressure is going to have more effect on the side with more moles of gas. So that's one way that scientists have figured out how to perturb the system. Okay. Another thing we can do is cool it off because this is an exothermic reaction. It's releasing heat. So cooling it will actually make the product more quickly. All right, so we can maximize yield by doing all these things. Remove the product, right? So if you take somebody off the teeter-totter, that side goes up, right? So that's what they did. I talked about the pressure. We talked about lowering the temperature. In this case, actually, they make a compromise because high temperature favors optimal catalyst, right? And they actually use a catalyst to make this go really quickly. All right, so let's just look at what's going on inside this reaction chamber. Right, so what they do, right, they have an inlet where the gases come in, the nitrogen and the hydrogen, they compress that, right, that goes into the reaction chamber, okay, there's the catalyst right here, there's the heating coil, those particles of gas are colliding really quickly, lots of reaction is happening, and we're producing a lot of ammonia, right, so all the gases, including the ammonia product, are going to go over here to the compression chamber and let's take a closer look at that. Ammonia has a lower boiling point than nitrogen and hydrogen so what they do is they actually condense that and we end up with ammonia liquid and you can actually buy ammonia as a liquid in the supermarket. So there's our product. Okay, and this is happening on an industrial scale. It's, an, it's a really pretty amazing thing. And what's really cool, right? You're gonna learn a little bit more about this guy. This is the German chemist, right, that came up with this. And I want you to do a little bit of homework and read about him. He's an interesting figure. He won the Nobel Prize for this, which that was controversial. And you'll find out more about that when you do your homework. All right, that concludes our second day of the nitrogen cycle with the human impact. And I'd like for you to do your classwork now and answer some questions, making those connections. And you have another diagram of this system and you can annotate it and do whatever you need to do to answer those questions. Good luck.